Let's take our Bibles and look once again in Hosea, this time chapter 9, reading through this book of the prophet Hosea, because he was a prophet during the time that we're studying here of the kings. Primarily, his message was to those northern tribes that had followed after Jeroboam, Solomon's servant after his death, and they established a whole new worship center up there in Samaria, worship of the golden calf. And uh, that went on for approximately 200 years. And yet, as we're reading, we're coming now down toward the end. And Hosea was a prophet that was raised up as any prophet, first with the condemnation of every type of false worship it's prevalent in the day, and you say, well, where did false worship begin? All the way in the garden, when Adam and Eve's eyes were turned off of the tree of life to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's what everybody's been pursuing ever since. They're just like little birds jumping from branch to branch on that same tree of knowledge of good and evil, always looking for some new thing, and yet it's not Christ. But here were these prophets that the Lord had raised up and taught of himself and were emboldened to preach the truth in their day. Few though they were, the Elijahs, the Elishas, the Jonah, the Amoses, the Hosea, and then of course Hosea was contemporary with Micah and Isaiah. So the message is consistent. Here, it says in verse 1 of our chapter, chapter 9, Rejoice not. See the contrast where Paul was writing to the Philippians, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. He was writing to people that had been taught of Christ. And the Spirit of Christ revealed in them there's reason for rejoicing, but there's no reason for rejoicing where people are religious in their endeavors. And yet, as Paul said, not according to knowledge, not according to the truth. So rejoice not, O Israel. Again, we see Israel speaking specifically of those ten tribes of the northern kingdom. For joy as other people, for thou hast gone a whoring from thy God. Thou hast loved a reward upon every corn floor. In other words, everything that they were doing was for personal gain, for what they could receive. So the teaching of health, wealth, and prosperity is not anything new. It existed back in Hosea's day. And the feasting, the mirth, the dancing, and the entertainment, and all these things that was going on, Hear the prophet saying, don't rejoice over those things. It stirs up the flesh, makes people feel better about themselves, but they're under condemnation. They've gone a whoring from their God. The floor and the wine press shall not feed them, and the new wine shall fail in her. These were things that they were being promised by the false preachers of the day. If they continued with zeal to worship their God in their way, that they would always have his blessing. Well, here Isaiah or Hosea is saying, not so. They shall not dwell in the Lord's land. There's no mixture of false and truth. If you're not in the Lord's land, in other words, in Christ, in whom is the truth, then you're not in the Lord's land, no matter how you define it. It says, Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Here he's foretelling that the day was coming when these ten tribes would be taken away into captivity, and there would be an end. They shall not offer wine offerings to the Lord, neither shall they be pleasing unto him, their sacrifices shall be unto them as the bread of mourners. All that eat thereof shall be polluted, for their bread 
for their soul shall not come in the house of the Lord. There's no room for leaven when it comes to worship. That you either worship the Lord in truth as he sets himself forth in these scriptures, which is in Christ alone, or it's not worship. No matter what sacrifices they bring and offer, it's not to the Lord. And therefore, you cannot have his blessing. What will ye do in the solemn day? In other words, that day when the Lord would bring these ten tribes back into Egypt, back under bondage, even before Assyria came down. The Lord took his hand off of the situation and the Egyptians came up and began to take many of these back into captivity in Egypt, right back where they began where the Lord delivered them initially. What will ye do in the solemn day and in the day of the feast of the Lord? For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver, metals shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. The days of visitation are come. Days of recompense are come. It's not talking about a good recompense. It's talking about judgment. Israel shall know it. The prophet is a fool. It's not speaking of Hosea the prophet, but those that prophesy are as fools. And the spiritual man is mad because they were prophesying, giving false hope to Israel thinking that no matter what Hosea declared, that, no, no, if you continue to follow us, you'll be all right. And that's the way it is today. People like to gather themselves people that doctors and preachers that promise them the moon, and yet they're under condemnation. And for the multitude of thine iniquity and the great hatred watchman of Ephraim it says was with my God but the prophet is a snare of a fowler in all his ways and hatred in the house of his God there again there's a distinction who was the watchman of Ephraim well, that would have been Hosea that would have been a way that he referred to himself here that the Lord had established him as a watchman in Ephraim in those ten northern tribes. That's the ones that primarily he prophesied to. And yet the prophet, that is those prophets that they followed after, promising prosperity in spite of their idolatry, is a snare of a follower in all his ways. A snare means that it's like a bird flying and all of a sudden they cast a net and catch it. That's for the destruction of that bird and hatred in the house of his God. They don't honor the Lord. In fact, they despise the very God whose house they hated. They hated the house. They hated God himself. What was the house? It stood in contrast to that false worship there in Samaria. The Lord had always purposed that in Jerusalem, through that temple of Solomon, that it be a type and picture of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet there was a hatred in the house of his God. They have deeply corrupted themselves, as in the days of Gibeah. It goes all the way back to Judges 19, if you want a reference there. It describes the horrific crimes of perversion and violence in Israel in the days of the judges. So here's a reference. They have deeply corrupted themselves as in the days of Gibeah. Things don't get better when God turns men over to their own reprobate minds. They continue the same perversion of their forefathers. So here Hosea says that in his day it's just as bad as it was back in that day. And a lot of times we say it seems like things are getting worse and worse. It's just 
it's the same as always has been. The corruption began all the way back in the fall, but the Lord has purposed that it manifests itself in a greater way now for us to see. And so therefore he will remember their iniquity. He will visit their sins. Stop and consider that no matter how man seeks to approach unto God, if the Lord Jesus Christ has not paid that sin debt for that people, then God will always remember their iniquity. That stands in contrast to their sins will I remember no more. It's not that those that God saves are any better than those that he condemns. The difference is Christ and his sacrifice. And in his mercy and grace, he, the omniscient God, remembers our sins no more because Christ paid the debt fully, completely. That's what it means to be justified before God in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But all others, their sin is ever before the Lord. It doesn't matter how they try to reform or change or adopt new ideas, etc. Their sins are ever before the Lord. And when it says he will visit their sins, that means there's a day of judgment against every sin and sinner for whom Christ did not pay their sin debt. It's a very solemn message. But just as Israel here continued to show their manifest their deadness, described up there were their pleasant places or their silver, it turns into nettles and thorns. That's the Lord describing that even the spiritual condition of these. So now here, the Lord through the prophet expresses the barrenness of that people in judgment. Verse 10, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your father, says the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. So as they were planted in that land, it was according to God's promise that Joshua led them in. So going all the way back there. And in spite of God's forbearance, in spite of his mercies toward them, yet, and that's what he's referring to, like grapes in the wilderness. You don't expect to find grapes in the wilderness, but where the Lord planted them, and, and that was out of faithfulness to Abraham, to his covenant with Abraham. And even over time, because of his promise to David to preserve a remnant, all of this these unexpected blessings on this people. It wasn't because they deserved them or were in any way deserving of the Lord's forbearance, but after they had been planted in that land, every promise that God ever made for that people of Israel to take them into land was fulfilled. Read the end of the book of Joshua. There wasn't one thing that remained that God had not promised that wasn't fulfilled. But what happened? Well, it says they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves unto that shame and their abominations were according as they loved. People do what they want to do. Baal Peor, if you remember, that was the place where in Numbers 25, Balaam told Baal, invite them to your sacrifices and to your orgies, basically, because that's where prostitutes sold themselves and drew people into their idolatry. That was at Baal Peor. You remember over 30,000 the Lord destroyed in a day. But they went to Baal Peor. People say all the time, well, why doesn't God just let man decide, man choose? There's an example why you don't want man choosing. In spite of all of the promises of scripture that are here in Christ, man will always in his nature, unless he's drawn by the grace of God to Christ, follow after, as it says here, the things they love, which is the flesh, flesh. That's where the idolatry began to multiply. And it says there, they became an abomination like the thing they love. Actually, 
abominations were according as they love. That's what idolatry is before the Lord. It's an abomination. People don't think about, even in our day, the abomination before the Lord. They're looking at social injustices. They're looking at murder rates. They're looking at drunkenness. All of these things saying we live in an evil day. The one thing they don't consider is their false worship. And it's as prevalent today in this country and throughout the world as ever been. But people left to themselves would never perceive it. Why do people worship the way they do? Because they love it. And we'd be right in there with them were it not for the grace of God that has taught us of Christ and drawn us out. And they become like the very God that they worship and serve. It's whether it's health, that becomes their God, whether it's wealth, whether it's prosperity. In reality, their God is their own will. But the Lord here is pronouncing their demise of a dryness and a barrenness that would come. It says in verse 11, as for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird. There's nothing lasting in man's attempts at worship, false worship. Glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. This is in contrast to the, the fruitfulness of those that the Lord has spared by his grace and mercy. They're blessed in Christ, but all others, even from birth, their demise is set forth. Everybody's all excited about birth of a new baby. Oh, how cute. What a precious. But from birth, that child is on the path to destruction unless they're one that the Lord has elected in his grace and from whom Christ has paid the debt. It says in verse 12, though they bring up their children, yet will I bereave them that there shall not be a man left. Yea, woe also to them when I depart from them. See, that's it. Depart from means to leave to your own reprobate mind. And when the Lord does that, there's no blessing that can ever come. Ephraim, verse 13, as I saw Tyrus is planted in a pleasant place, but Ephraim shall bring forth his children to the murderer. We're going to study that here in a little bit in our text in 2 Kings 16. These, even not only the golden calf, but they adopted the worship of Moloch, where they were actually giving their firstborn children to this god of fire. Pictures of the of, of bull's tail and body with a man's head, and literally that. Brass was heated to such a degree that if people wanted prosperity, they'd literally go and lay that child in these arms of this God while the, the, the fire was burning. And they actually had drummers drumming and trumpets playing to drown out the, the cries of the baby, thinking that somehow by doing that they would have prosperity. You see to what point people seek their own well-being in such a, a manner. That's what he's talking about when he says, shall bring forth his children to the murderer. But also, we know that, as the Lord said of the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil, who is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. There's no innocent babies born unless God is pleased to having elected a child and cause that child to grow up then to be brought to Christ in faith. It's no different than bringing forth a child to the murder. That's what they are by nature. So the cry here, the question, give them, O Lord, what wilt thou give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. In reality, when you read that, Hosea, here is praying for mercy when he realizes that every baby that's born in that condemnation, it only is adding fire upon fire against the day, wrath upon wrath against the day of wrath. 
And so Hosea here in verse 14, his plea is really pray for plea for mercy, but better not to give them any more children. We don't hear people praying that way. Everybody's wanting to have babies. But unless they're the Lord's, every child born into this world is a child to the murderer. It's a it's a it's under condemnation. And here particularly, Hosea, knowing the judgment that was coming, he's literally praying, Lord, give them few children so that these children will not have to face the horrors of your coming judgment. So I know I've talked to parents that right now are in that prayerful mindset. So their families and what kind of world are they going to grow up in? And if they're not the Lord's, it'd be better not to have a child. That's what Hosea is praying here. All their wickedness is in Gilgal. For there I hated them. And uh, Gilgal is mentioned again. It was it had become a center of idolatry in Israel. At one time, Gilgal was actually a place where the prophets were trained under Elijah and Elisha. Back in 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1, how quickly things turned. Where now, in Hosea's day, it became the very center of false worship. You'll mention, you can look it up in your concordance, see Gilgal, see how it's mentioned. That's why the Lord says, for there I hated them. <laughs> this is a God that the world doesn't know. God doesn't hate anybody. Go back and read your Bible. It says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I, what, hated. God hates every wicked way. Unless, again, one has been a chosen vessel, given to Christ, for whom Christ paid the debt. There's nothing but hatred. He says here, I will drive them out of mine house. I will love them no more. I will no more show them kindness, is what that word love is. Because God is merciful, the just and the unjust. And all their princes are revolters. The Ephraim is spent, their root is dried up. When you went back and looked in that day, Ephraim was quite a prosperous. These ten tribes of the north, quite prosperous. That's what people look to and think, well, God must be blessing. Yet the Lord's saying spiritually is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. Yea, though they bring forth, yet will I slay even the blow fruit of their womb. Such was the impending judgment. We're talking now, getting down close to when the Lord would bring the Syria, a very vicious nation, down and literally wipe out these ten tribes where no one even recognized it anymore. My God will cast them away. Here it is, because they did not hearken unto him. They didn't have ears to hear him. They followed their own devices. And this was already dealt with in that old covenant, those terms when Moses was reading the covenant law to the ones that had made it through the 40 years in the wilderness. They didn't make it through because they were any better than those that died, but the Lord renewed his covenant back there in Deuteronomy chapter 30. You can write that reference down, verses 14 to 18. And it was pretty clear. If they departed from the Lord, he would destroy them. And that they would be wanderers among the nations. In essence, the Lord was saying to them, you like following idolatry? You like the worship of false gods, well guess what, I'm going to take you into one of their lands and you can go ahead and live under their dominion and see exactly how that is. So as we read this, we're reminded not much has changed. We live in the same world, idolatry. If any do stand for Christ, it's because it pleads God to reveal Him in them. But all around us in the name of religion, they're using the name of God, they're even using the name of Christ. Promote their false religion, and the only end of that can be destruction in God's time. Gracious Father, thank you for your word, how solemn it is. I pray that even as we've read it, you would be 
stirred in our own hearts and minds. Not to be taken up with the direction of this world, the ways of worship that men follow, but rather to be content even though we be few in number. Look to you as God of very God and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Savior of sinners such as we are. And for your grace and mercy in me, could it ask for no greater blessing than that to be found in Christ, not having our own righteousness, which is by the works of the law, but by that faith that you have revealed in your word concerning Christ and his finished work. Grant us eyes to look to him alone. We give you the praise and honor and glory in his precious name.